<laughs> Some 30,000 women wing the nine mile perimeter of Greenham Common Cruise Missile Base. Base. <laughs> Base. In Berkshire yesterday, in an emotional demonstration against nuclear weapons, mm. in such an inaccessible part of the country and in appalling weather conditions, it was a, oh, it was a remarkable show of strength of the anti-nuclear lobby. <laughs> People kept a low profile. Please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Police kept a low profile, and in some places must have been outnumbered one thousand to one by the <laughs> colleagues of riot shields had been ferried into the base on standby before first light, but there was not a single incident. Men were excluded from the demonstration. <laughs> and told to run the crash, prepare, <laughs> prepare the food and keep out of the way. <laughs> at, at dawn, marquees and tents began to be built at each of the eight gates into the base. The men were confined to, eight, to gate eight, <laughs> making such things as wax torches and sandwiches. <laughs> Working as if on a conveyor belt, they made more than 3,000 Marmite sandwiches. <laughs> In wholemeal bread, to be given free to the needy. Among the first recipients were six coachloads of women from Edinburgh who had set off at 10 p.m. the night before. <laughs> It was snowing hard when they arrived, and the organisers feared that many people would be put off coming to Queen. Oh,
bomb that and they'll be living there. Yeah. And it kills living things. Yeah. 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 question is one that's got to be really has got to be thrashed out mm. without being emotive or, or um is there anyone wants to see a coffin and the kettle just gone? No, take it off. Yes yesterday 
I spent the whole morning searching for a chequebook and there's three about. No, there's one at the Green Gate, one I don't know where they are actually. We we had a system a different system before Christmas that didn't work. This is another one and this isn't working either. <coughs> So there's not a summons or anything, it's just to give them a chance to prepare their defence, if any. Because this, is, this is the complete evidence, as will be presented to the court. Uh, Sylvia Boys. Sylvia, Katrina, Juliet. I don't think any of them are here. No. Will they be, will they be coming back? Um, I've got to. And I, I have. All these women had to go off to London this morning, right? I had all these problems to get off to London. And I've got a fucking car going up there, right? And it's going to be empty and they've all gone now and it's, it's like really silly, you know? And you can't shut my mouth when I see. Aggie, you can't forbid me to see. And you can't forbid my tears to flow. And you can't shut my mouth when I see. Women who are on trial have particularly asked that they're supported in court by women. Now, obviously, there's no way we can stop anybody coming in, and you're the ones who are going to choose who comes in. But I just wanted you to know that those were the wishes of the women on trial. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. That's a lot. Good. She was talking about all the diseases, you know, that run in, in, in the fat in families and how families can be wiped out and the um, um, asthma as well. And I was just thinking about my mother and I was just thinking, I just kept it, it all became really personal. As she yeah. was talking, it just became really personal and all the friends I've got have got leukemia at the moment. And I just thought, I've been sitting here waiting and waiting to make a decision about whether to have a child or not because of all the other things that have got to be done because everything's so wrong. And now, you know, it's just, I don't know. There's just no point. I know. Evidence. 
The first to do so this morning was 73-year-old Mel Logan, a grandmother and the oldest of the peace protesters. She said she had lived through two world wars and couldn't just... Thank you very much, you kid. For God's sake, I'm doing a piece of camera to put your, your project I mean, in a logical, in a way that people will understand. And, and to, to make, them to make out that you're making some sense and you're going to clown around in the background. That doesn't do you that's case any good at all. But look, woman, I mean, we are clowning around. That's the way I'm to give our spirits up and we are here. All right. I, I don't. I mean, I don't need to put but makeup. I'm here to put your case. All right, but put it then, and don't I get aggravated by me. The I mean, this bloody is... thing won't be used if you're doing cartwheels in the background. But why? Because it'll be distracting, and the assets won't use it. But I mean, they, why, why should it be distracting? We're doing all kinds of things here. I know you are, and when you know, we film you doing them, that's fine. But when I'm doing a TV film, camera, you're just film, being because it's distracting. Because it's better to have it on television rather than have you acting, isn't it? Come on. Not all the defendants are giving evidence, but those women who want to have had the chance to put their case. The first to do so this morning was 73-year-old Nell Logan, a grandmother and the oldest of the peace protesters. She said she had lived through two world wars and couldn't just stand by while these dangerous weapons were being made. I felt compelled to do something for the children and for future generations. Another defendant said a crime was being committed at the base, a conspiracy to commit genocide. Deliberately did cartwheels in the background of my piece. She didn't. Oh, you come think on. Think I don't piece. think you're you stupid. You think we really care about the piece All morning, I did cartwheels deliberately in your back. That's yes, true. Yes, exactly. That's all but I'm I don't saying. always do things I'm I know you I've seen I've, you here I've before, but time. you were deliberately doing cartwheels in the background, and you must know. But there's the way all right, I'm speaking. sorry, I called there's you a tit. People, right? I know there's a way of speaking to people. I've got a job to do. And well, my job is sound. completely messed up when I'm in full flow in a piece of camera, having had got you enough difficulty in getting the thing in my head in the first place. I, what I don't appreciate is someone coming to do cartwheels in the background. So you know it's going to be really. I mean, sounds like we're here. No, I don't think really. When you want to take pictures, no, I think you're right? on the rest of your time we go away and no, I think you're about you. It's not like that. Anybody else for you? Right, everybody stood up and we started to sing and everything. And finally, the magistrate said he wanted the cops to move, but the cops just moved to the side of the courtroom. They got cops all over the side of the courtroom. They got the next courtroom was full of cops. They got cops down there. There's a woman sitting next to me who's American. She said, You know, I'm American and I'm shocked. <laughs> I'm American and I'm shocked.
party anymore to men using us as an excuse to be protected and looking after their children. We'll leave home for peace, you know, to have no more of your wars. And every woman in the world stand up and say that. We couldn't have a war, you know. You men would have to go and play on some other bloody planet. I have been in correspondence with what is called a dissident. A, Over a, a long period what of time. What are dissidents? I just don't care you what, what are. either of you say. We are all oppressed. The Russians are oppressed. We are oppressed. In different ways, there's nobody is free. Nobody in this whole yes, bloody course, world is free. No, there, no, isn't there a are free nation in the whole world. Also, one in interesting question for me. Uh, it's uh, a kind of community here, you know. Uh, uh, it, this camp exists a uh, rather long time. Yes, and yes. you uh, just live here in this camp yes. and um, uh, without, so to say, uh, usual regulation, outside the usual regulations of uh, well, city community, for example, without city council, without police, without um, uh, well, uh, uh, traffic, uh, traffic. Any system. No system, no code, no... Um, 
hierarchy, no committee. Shop stewards or something no, like that. Nothing. No structures at all. No, because there's this thing on the other side. Put it on. Yes. Yes, we'll get it on. Someone's going to take that off. That's it. That's it. Push. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Morning. <laughs> locks were made in America. Sorry? American locks. They're American, American made. locks. Well, we have English locks. Well, you know, if you're going to do the job, you'll do it properly. Do you reckon? Yeah, go on. Put it off. Is it well? All of these ones in the world. Now I've got the uh, set down for five again. Go ahead, take it. America, I hope you make good locks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not big enough. Get a, get a father guy down. Or a hacksaw or whatever. Yeah, we're close about my goose egg, I remember. <laughs> Me and Eleanor were trying to... Hey, Kerry, did you know we were going to hatch goose eggs? Yeah. We had the... Eleanor had a goose egg strapped... A goose egg strapped to her stomach and I had one strapped around my boob here. And we thought, we're going to be mother. Oh, nice. There are three bank accounts. Three bank accounts, yeah. There's... The Women's Peace Camp account, which is what we, sorry, which seven of us are signatories for, 
No. And that's our normal, that's what we got access to. I can hear when I can see. Sorry? It sounds there. How's that? Yeah. There's also the Women's Peace Camp Action account, which only two women are signatories to. That's Helen and Angela. And they're the only people who can get money in and out of that account. I also believe there's a London account. There is. For, but that's totally separate. That's, that's London women getting it together themselves for their own support groups. Well, as far as the Women's Peace Camp account is concerned, which is the only one <coughs> we know about, <coughs> we're in trouble. Because I don't think that the Lloyds Bank in Louvre is a particularly no, good bank no. to be in. I don't think that their bank practice with us is normal. But it's so but it's, hang on, it's hang on. not simple like that. Oh, wait on, Jane. Jane's got a hand up. But that, it could be it's simple. not just a question, though, of doing it like that. There's a couple of problems. Uh, one of them being, it's not just a question of waste, but different people's ideas about what is extravagant and what isn't. Yeah. Who has the power to say people do this and they you do that? The rock in the mud. Collectively, we all no. do. But collectively. Well, supposedly. But it doesn't work that way. No, but well, we can make it work more. Yeah. more I mean, everybody that way. Talk well, we do. I mean, it is expensive. You know, now that there's lots of publicity and there's lots of things going on, we also need a lot of money. I mean, we go through a lot of money. Well, we even took without out, we being took extravagant. Out, I mean, so if we said Wednesday afternoon for a general meeting, like to say what speakers, what money we need, and all that, and this is happening. If you know you want to go, you'll need so much petrol money. Blah blah blah, and sort of do it on a weekly basis. I think that's really mm. good. Mm. I mean, if you want to, really if, if you, we want to start off that, I don't mind starting off like doing it from now to next week, and we can just mm -hmm. sort of yeah. see as like two or three weeks, see how that develops. That would also yeah. help. No, with a totally different them. thing of, of making sure that there's speakers, because <coughs> you could say what speakers are needed for the next week, mm -hmm. right yeah. there and then at the meeting, yeah. because That's you know what bit we were having last night with that speakers. Book. So we'd need a little briefcase, a little <laughs> waterproof briefcase with sort of a couple of books and info and sort of. You know, it's yeah, just, and we can see like over the next two or three weeks how that works, yeah. and like how we can sort of get more collective control yeah, over the decision making yeah. and the money. Yeah. It'll only be a, a learning, developing yeah. thing.
My name is Redman, I represent the Associated Press. I bet you sell it to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like the press. They're a bunch of wankers. Jill, you're really eloquent this I know, I'm in the press. Any blokes coming along, I'll take it out on them. I'm in a very bad The press association is domestic to the UK. Women of Greenham, just before I disappear, can I just do a quick stab of your breakfast? The morning after what? After the CND festival. Nothing to do with us. We have the incidental people that are here on the scene. The morning after yesterday was better done at the Orange Camp, which was organised by CND. Just tell us yesterday. No, I know it. I know it. I said. That's why we're in a bed tempered this morning. Well, please don't take it out of me. Well, don't put yourself in the way of it. If you don't like it, leave. I put in a... Oh, you know what? You're winking at me. I mean, take your picture and leave. I mean, I can't stand it. What my friends did, he's quiet. Come on, do it. I'm going to be on that temple. I think it's about that temple. Thank you. Well done, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to make a donation, I'll be pleased. If you can't, don't worry. Does it feel a very good meeting? Feels like a green and crowded meeting at the moment. <laughs> I could never go to a talk where I have to go a biography. free. Bio how do you call it? What in English? Biography. 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 Uh, about yourself, you know. So you get presented as uh, something. You know, it depends on how long you were here and what you did before and yeah. like what kind of person you are if you how you are presented yeah presented in a way and i i think it's wrong if we like get presented on a on a silver plate or so and look these green and women you know and get shown around and that seems to me the case in this oh it seems to be the the case here but actually in this journey that people try to present us on a silver plate you know I well, you know, sent that one up simply by announcing that I was potty trained at such and such an age, and that. What's well, uh, an interpreter? <laughs> but, yeah. but, no, you don't. <laughs> when there's a military general there. Uh, especially this America tour, there's been lots of tours, but especially this America tour has been set up to become a very powerful status trip, <coughs> and <coughs> and it's getting away from what we're doing here. You know, we're living in mud. We're going to prison. We're, we're surviving evictions, we're living in tents. But why are we they want to know why? why? They want to know why? Yeah, but you can't sell second-hand experience. That's what you found yeah, out in Denmark. You can only create something there. 
you know, and it it becomes hypocrisy to, I think, to go uh, this... on to, to to go and tour in big lecture theatres with all this this paraphernalia and media and everything, and to to, to, to go off from here from what from the way we're living here and go off and do and do it like that over there. That's just it's just hypocrisy to me. I don't like the power of it. I I think that's anti technological. No, no, not at all. I, mean, I, yeah, I just don't feel able to take part in this meeting anymore before we don't talk about ourselves and how we live together yet. Because there's something not right. Mm. No, I went home with them and I just felt I'm not sure I can keep on living here. And, and then I found out from Skeeter mm. and from Beatrice that they both thought that. And I had no idea about that. That's three camp women who live here who are thinking that we're not we're not sure we can continue living here. You know, that is serious. How does it help if we because all go it's away? Going on with the agenda and I made very clear that I don't want to be in this yeah. meeting anymore. I mean, look at these two. Well, She's what weeping. Do we all just carrying on with the agenda. We talk about We talk about it. You can't just go on with an agenda because you've got an agenda. But if women are upset, we've got to talk about why they're upset. I know, but then Mary will be upset in a minute. Be sensitive. On I am the sensitive. I'm also tired of this bullshit. I am being quiet. It's just sensitivity. It's showing quiet. I'm not an insensitive person. I care. Do people come and talk to me. Talk about American citizens. Nobody talks about resentment. Be sensitive. I am sensitive. No, you're not. I want to know why. Why are you crying? Because I'm very upset about this meeting. People are shouting at each other. People are making each other really feel bad. If we choose to walk alone, for us there is no safety zone. If we're attacked, we bear the blame. They say that we began the game. And though you prove your injury, the judge may set the rapist free. Therefore, the victim is to blame. Call it nature, but rape the name. Reclaim the night and win the day. We want the right that should be our own. A freedom women have seldom known. The right to live, the right to walk alone. husband has his lawful right, can take his wife whenever he likes, and courts uphold time after time that rape in marriage is no crime. The choice is hers and hers alone. Submit or lose your kids and home. When love becomes a legal claim, call it duty. But rapes the name. When exploitation is the norm, rape is found in many forms. Lower wages, meaner tasks, poorer schooling, second class. We serve our own, and like the men, we serve employers. It follows then that bodies rape is nothing new. But just the servant's final due. We've raised our voices in the past. And this time we'll not be the last. Our body's gift is ours to give, not payment for the right to live. Since we oppose the status quo, we claim the right to answer no. If without consent he stake a claim, call it rape, for rape's the name. Arlene, Arlene, I've got another hot water bottle here. How many boys would you have? About six? No. Uh, no. I'm not a true one. Oh, we are, are nearly. <laughs> <laughs> You're a midwife and a romantic one. <laughs> really? 
Yes. And there was Sarah, Sarah who was at the camp, who was a midwife. Was I'm sure the nursing school never told you about delivering babies in benders. <laughs> no. And <laughs> people are always used to. Bunnies, you call them? Why do you call them bunnies? I don't know. Oh. It's like saying this is round today on the couple of them. Nose. Hmm? Sounds like he's got stuff in his nose. He probably has, actually. Do you want a hottie? Mm-hmm. Is that hot? It's Luke. Maybe yeah. we can, uh... Lynn, did you want to ask someone to pour more water? Could someone pour more water? Really hot water bottle. Actually, this one could be put back on and heated up. A really hot water Shall we pass it out? Can we pass the bottle out? We'll top it up. It, I think that water needs to be heated up a little bit. There's hot water ready, Jill. There's hot water ready, is there? Okay. Another one coming. The most important thing for me was actually having him here. Yeah. You know, being able to give birth here in this bender. And I think that um, it's really important that women can have their babies in exactly the way they want to because I think all women are concerned about their babies. They wouldn't do something to cause the baby to, you know, put it in any danger. It's the women that know that more than anything. It doesn't need mm. doctors or whatever to be telling women what's safe and what isn't. Yeah. And um, it was a really good experience just being able to do that here. It was all about whether there's a future or not, yeah. really. And I, I decided, even if I thought there wasn't a future, I'd want to have a child because it would be it would be good just for that moment, you know, for however long it lasted. It would still be good, it's not a good thing. It's good, you know, in itself. But then, I don't know. That, I think that there is a future now, I'm absolutely certain of it. <laughs> time and time again, like sort of woman imagery, obviously, and the web and the moon and snakes. I've got a feeling I'm going to get them all in here somewhere, but I'm not quite sure where at the moment. I did, when we were at the High Court on whenever it was last week, and there were so many motions flying around and I couldn't sort of I didn't want to be sort of too much involved in a lot of other things because trying to just keep myself together. And I just did this picture in a book and it that was like my instead of going around sort of going, ah I just did a picture of a woman in a book and I could show it you in a bit. And uh, just like sort of anger but sort of holding on to something here and it was like sort of holding on to yourself and your sanity and holding on to that sort of core of whatever it is that you are that you just must protect and keep safe and, and also like sort of baby and all the birth or the, the circle and the world and all that sort of business and this picture just felt right that was just how I felt when I was in court it was you know like every picture is a self-portrait sort of scene well this definitely was <laughs> Take your personal things out, but we've seized this on behalf of the court. <laughs> oh, bless you. No. Uh, no, no, my dear, this is no no way to do it, my love. We, 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 we can move along. We can. Get off. No. Get off. 
No, we've seized the car, my dear. You I'm, have not. I'm, my name is Davis, and I'm telling I you on behalf of the High you. Court. Who's pulling uh, me? You're on not taking of the High Court, my love. We have seized it, You're my dear. You're not taking this car. No, fair enough. That's what you say at the moment. Yeah. Now, all right. Yes, we're no, not don't, taking don't, this let's car. Let's just talk rationally about it, my dear. I would feel the same way as you. If somebody came up and told me they were taking my car, this is it, my car. I would feel the same as you. Not you're a part of the peace women's movement here, my love, and yes. you're on the camp. Yes. And our instructions are to remove you and your assets, and this is a part of your this assets. This is not, you're not taking my car. <laughs> Who does the car belong to? Does it belong to you? Yes. Right, there you are, my love, sir, there you are. Is it really and truly? No, I'm, I'm not there you are, your love. But it is. Anything, no, you're but this not is the way it... You're taking my car. No, right, this is your right to say that. So yeah. what are you going to do, sit in it? Yeah. Right, you are then. So we'll have to remove you, my dear. Sorry. Why can't you think? move around car? Because we have seized it on behalf of the High Court. For what, for what reason? For what to reason? defray the costs of the removing of the peace from the Jesus, there's no way it's going to cost anything. We just, we just move. If you if you've got if you've got a knot, have you got a notice? I, I am here. Oh yes, we have a high court. I am seeing it. No, fair enough. Then the, the officer of the high court will show it to you and I will get yes, them to show I'd it. Yes, I'd like to see it. But I don't want to. I don't see why people lady, can't move I don't want to get more in trouble than you are. Yes. You drive away, my love. I then you are taking crown property. Yeah, I'm not taking crown property. Because I've told you this we have this seizures on behalf car. of the court. This is my car that's with quite, all my personal belongings. Yes, well that's what I would like you to do. Remove your personal belongings, my dear. Of her and your this bag. car is my personal belongings. Yes. because she is not living.
to you, a spiritual lobotomy. If you cannot see, Mr. if it becomes right, an academic look, look, exercise to you. Hang on, hang on. Right. Let, 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 don't go away now. Now you started. Right. Right. Let's. Let's. Have, what I want from you. Right. Right. Um, don't make it too long, will you? No, it's, it's right. Okay. okay. Don't oh, miss the film. Okay. Right. Okay. Here we, here we go. Come on. Come on. Yeah, come on. What, what's your reaction to what's going on here today? I think it's disgraceful and it's disgusting, and I'm more. Actually, I'm more angry with the people who are standing by and letting it happen. Because I didn't find out until I got here what, what learning there is here, you know, what things you can learn by living differently. You get so trapped into to this way that you've got to be, you know, and the values that you, you're supposed to have and everything values change here and you're bound to take that back with you you know like everyone seems to care about one another you know if anybody's hurt like you know everyone's sort of caring it's amazing and just that thought that everyone's sort of like looking after you makes you feel better i don't know why more women don't come really <laughs> A lot of people feel that they can't go against the authority. They're trained from a very early age that <coughs> got some authorities there and it's going to take care of you and just trust in it and everything could be fine, you know. You can't just leave it up to them. Hand in hand, the line extends all around the nine mile fence.
Administration done something to take action against Arab states uh, that foment this kind of terrorism. What we've done is to support Arab states that want to stand up against international terror. Quite different. We believe in supporting without jeopardizing the security of Israel in any way because they are our one strategic ally in the area. They are the one democracy in the area and our relations with them has never been better. But we do believe in reaching out to the, what they call the GCC, those Gulf Cooperative Council states, those moderate Arab states in that world, and helping them with defensive weapons to guard against international terror or radical Islam perpetuated by Khomeini. And because we've done that, and because the Saudis chopped down a couple of those intruding airplanes a while back, I think we have helped keep the peace in the Persian Gulf. Congresswoman Ferraro, you and uh, Vice President, former Vice President Mondale have criticized the President over the bombings in Lebanon. Well, what would you do to prevent such attacks? Let me first say that terrorism is a, a global problem. And let me say, secondly, that um, the, Mr. Bush has referred to the embassy that was held in Iran. When those hostages, all 52 of them, came home alive. Uh, it was at that time that President Reagan uh, gave a speech welcoming them home as America did. We were so excited to see them back. But what he said was, the United States has been embarrassed for the last time. You're going to stand tall, and if hot, this ever happens again, there's going to be swift and immediate steps taken to address the wrong that our country has fought, found it, has suffered. In April of 1983, I was in, uh, in um, Beirut and visited the ambassador at the embassy. Two weeks later, that embassy uh, was bombed. At that time, you take a look at the crazy activities of terrorists. You can't blame that anybody. And they're going to do crazy things, and you just don't know what's going to happen. The following October, there was another bombing. And that bombing took place at the Marine bar Barracks, where there were 242 young men who were killed. Right after that bombing occurred, there was a commission set up called the Long Commission. And that commission did a study at the, the, the security arrangements around where the Marines were sleeping and found that there was negligence, that they did not have proper gates up, proper uh, precautions to stop those trucks from coming in. And so the Long Commission issued a report, and President Reagan got up and he said, I'm commander in chief. I take responsibility. And we all waited for something to be done when he took responsibility. Well, last month we had our third bombing. First time, the first embassy, there was no gate up. The second time with our Marines, the gate was open. The third time, the gate was there, but it had not been installed. And what was the president's reaction? Well, the security arrangements were not in. Our people were placed in that embassy in an unsecured time. And the Marines who were guarding it were left to go away. And there are other people held guarding the embassy. Again, the president said, I assume responsibility. I'd like to know what that means. Are we going to take proper precautions before we put Americans in situations where they're in danger? 
or are we just going to walk away, throwing our arms up in the air now, quite a reversal from the first time, and from the first time when he said he's going to do something, or is this president going to take some action? Some Democrats cringe at the words spying and covert activity. Do you believe both of them have a legitimate role in countering terrorist activity around the world? I think they have a legitimate role in gathering information. And what had happened was the CIA in the last bombing had given information to our uh, administration with reference to the, the actual threats that that embassy was going to be bombed. So it wasn't the CIA was at fault. There's legitimate reason for the, the CIA to be in existence, and that's to gather intelligence information for our security. But when I see the CIA doing things like they're doing down in Central America, supporting a covert war, no, I don't support that kind of activity. Uh, the CIA is there to meant to protect our government, not there to subvert other governments. Vice President Bush. Well, I'm surprised to... Please. I think I just heard Mrs. Ferraro say that she would do away with all covert action. And if so, that has very serious ramifications, as the intelligence community knows. This is serious business. And sometimes it's quiet support for a friend. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave that one there. But let me help you with the difference, Ms. Ferraro, between Iran and the embassy in Lebanon. Iran, we were held by a foreign government. In, e in, the, in Lebanon, you had a wanton terrorist action where the government opposed it. We went to Lebanon to give peace a chance, to stop the bombing of civilians in Beirut, to remove 13,000 terrorists from Lebanon, we did. We saw the formation of a government of reconciliation, and for somebody to suggest, as our two opponents have, that these men died in shame, they better not tell the parents of those young Marines. They gave peace a chance, and our allies were with us, the British, the French, and the Italians. Congresswoman Ferraro. Let me just say, first of all, that I almost resent, Vice President Bush, your patronizing attitude that you have to teach me about foreign policy. I've been a member of Congress for six years. I was there when the embassy was held hostage in Iran, and I have been there, and I have seen what has happened in the past several months, 17 months, with your administration. Secondly, please don't categorize my answers either. Leave the interpretation of my answers to the American people who are watching this debate. And let me say further that no one has ever said that those young men who were killed through the negligence of this administration and others ever died in shame. No one who has a child who's 19 or 20 years old, a son, would ever say that about the loss of anybody else's child. Mr. White. Congresswoman Ferraro, you've repeatedly said that you would not want your son to die in an undeclared war for an uncertain cause. But recently, your running mate, Mr. Mondale, has suggested that it may become necessary to erect a military quarantine or blockade of Nicaragua. Under what circumstances would you advocate the use of military force, American combat forces, in Central America? I would advocate the use of force when it was necessary to protect the security of our country, protect our security interest, or protect our people, or protect the interest of our friends and neighbors. When President, well, I'm jumping the gun a bit, aren't I? When Mr. Mondale, when Mr. Mondale referred to the quarantine of uh, Central America, uh, a country in Central America, what he's referring to was a last resort after all other means of attempting to set, settle the situation down that region of the, of the world had been exhausted. Quite frankly, now what is being done by this administration is an Americanizing of a regional conflict. They're moving in militarily instead of promoting the Contador process, which as you know is the, the process that is in place with the support of Mexico and Colombia and Panama and Venezuela. Instead of supporting the process, our administration has in Nicaragua been supporting covert activities to keep that revolution going in order to overthrow the Sandinista government. In El Salvador, was not pushing uh, the head of the government to move toward correction of the civil rights, human rights uh, problems that existed there. And now this administration seems almost befuddled by the fact that Nicaragua is moving to participate in the Contador process. And El Salvador, through its president, Duarte, is reaching out to the guerrillas in order to negotiate a peace. Um, 
What Fritz Mondale and I feel about the situation down there is that what you do is you deal first through negotiation. That for force is not a first resort, but certainly a last resort in any instance. Uh, follow up, please. Um, many times in this history, uh, the United States has gone to war in order to defend freedom in other lands. Does your answer mean that you would be willing to forego the use of military force, even if it meant the establishment of a Soviet-backed dictatorship so close to our own borders? No. Um, I think what we have to do is work with the government, and I assume you're speaking about the government of Nicaragua, work with that government to achieve a pluralistic society. I mean, they do have elections uh, that are coming up on November 4th. I think we, we have to work with them to achieve a peaceful solution to bring about a pluralistic country. Uh, no, I'm not willing to, uh, to live with a, a force that um, could be a danger to our country. Uh, certainly, I, I would see that uh, our country would be there putting all kinds of pressure on uh, the neighboring uh, countries of Honduras, of Costa Rica, of El Salvador uh, to promote uh, a kind of society that we can all live with in security in this country. Vice President Bush. Both Cuba and Nicaragua are reported to be making extensive preparations to defend themselves against uh, an American invasion, which they claim could come this fall. And even some of your Democratic opponents in Congress have suggested that the administration may be planning a December surprise uh, invasion. Can you tell us under what circumstances a reelected Reagan administration would consider use of force in Central America or the Caribbean? We don't think we're to be required to use force. Let me point out that there are 2,000 Cuban military and 7,500 so-called Cuban advisors in Nicaragua. There are 55 American military in El Salvador. I went down, in the instructions of the president, to speak to the commandantes in El Salvador and told them that they had to move with Mr. Magana, then the president of El Salvador, to respect human rights. They have done that. They're moving well. I'm not saying it's perfect, but the difference between El Salvador and Nicaragua is like the difference between night and day. El Salvador went to the polls. Mr. Duarte was elected by 70% of the people in 70% in voting in a certifiably free election. In Nicaragua, you have something very different. You have a Marxist-Leninist group, the Sandinistas, that came into power talking democracy. They have aborted their democracy. They have humiliated the Holy Father. They have cracked down on the only press organ there, La Prensa, censoring the press, something that should concern every American. They have not had any human rights at all. They will not permit free elections. Mr. Cruz, who was to be the only viable challenger to Nicaragua, to the Sandinistas, to the Junta, to Mr. Ortega, went down there and found that the ground rules were so unfair that he couldn't even wage a campaign. One country is devoid of human rights. The other is struggling to perfect their democracy. We don't like it, frankly, when Nicaragua exports its revolution or serves as a conduit for supplies coming in from such democracies as North Korea, Bulgaria, the Soviet Union, and Cuba to try to destabilize El Salvador. Yes, we're concerned about that because we want to see this trend towards democracy that's continue. There have been something like 13 countries since we've come in move towards the democratic route. And let me say that Grenada is not unrelated, and I have a big difference with Ms. Ferraro on that one. We gave those four tiny Caribbean countries a chance. We saved the lives, and most of those a thousand students said that they were in jeopardy. Grenada was a proud moment because we did stand up for democracy. But in terms of threat of these countries, nuclear, I mean, uh, weapons, no, there's not that kind of a threat. It's Mr. Mondale that proposed the quarantine, not Ronald Reagan. Please. Considering this country's long respect for the rule of international law, was it right for the United States to be involved in mining the harbors of Nicaragua, a country we're not at war with, and to subsequently uh, refused to allow the world court to adjudicate that dispute in the complaint from Nicaragua? I, d I support what we're doing. It was supported to the Congress under the law. I support it. My only regret is that the aid for the, con for the Contras, those people that are fighting, freedom fighters, they want to see the democracy perfected in Nicaragua. 
Am I to understand from this assault on covert action that nowhere in the world would we do something that was considered just off base by when Mrs. Ferraro said she'd never support it? Would she never support it if the violation of human rights was so great and quiet support was necessary for freedom fighters? Yes, we're for the Contras. And let me tell you another fact about the Contras. Everyone that's not for this, everyone who wants to let that, that uh, Sandinista government prevail, just like that Castro did, all of that, the Contras are not Somacistas. Less than 5% of the Contras supported Somoza. These were people that wanted a revolution. These are people that felt the revolution was betrayed. These are people that support human rights. Yes, we should support them. Congresswoman Ferraro. I spent uh, a good deal of time in Central America in January and had an opportunity to speak to the Contras after being uh, in, San in uh, Nicaragua and in, in El Salvador. Let me just say that the situation as it exists now, uh, because of this administration's policies, we're not getting better. Uh, we're not moving toward a more secure area of the world. As a matter of fact, the number of troops that the Sandinistas have accumulated since the administration has started its covert activities has risen from 12 to 50,000. And of course, the number of Sylvan and Cuban advisors has also increased. Um, I did not support the mining of the harbors in Nicaragua. It is a violation of international law. Congress did not support it. And as a matter of fact, just this week, the Congress voted to cut off covert aid to Nicaragua unless and until a request is made and there is evidence of need for it and the Congress approves it again in March. So the Congress doesn't get laid on. The covert activities which I oppose in Nicaragua, those CIA covert activities in that specific uh, country are not supported by the Congress and believe it or not, not supported by the majority of people throughout this country. Vice President Bush. Well, I would simply like to make the distinction again between those countries that are searching for democracy and the handful of countries that have totally violated human rights and are going the Marxist route. Ortega, the Comandante, who's head of the Nicaraguan Sandinistas, is an avowed Marxist. They don't believe in the church. They don't believe in the free elections. They don't believe in all the values that we believe in. So it is our policy to support the democracies there. And when you have freedom fighters that want to perfect that revolution and go the democratic route, we believe in giving them support. We are for democracy in the hemisphere. We are for negotiation. Three dollars out of every four that we've sent down there has been for economic aid, to support the people's chance to eat and live and, and be happy and enjoy life. And one fourth only was military. You wouldn't get that from listening to Mr. Mondale. Ms. Quarles. Vice President Bush, the last three Republican administrations, Eisenhower, Nixon, and Ford, none of them soft on communism, met with the Soviets and got agreements on arms control. The Soviets haven't changed that much. Can you tell us why President Reagan has not met with the Soviet ministers at all and only met with Foreign Minister Gromyko less than a month ago? Yes, I can. The Car you mentioned the Gromyko meeting. Those were broken off under the Carter-Mondale days. There have been three separate Soviet leaders, Mr. Brezhnev, Mr. Andropov, and now Chernyenko. During their, that's three and a half, in three and a half years, three separate leaders. The Soviets have not been willing to talk. We are the ones that went to the table in INF. We had a good proposal, a moral proposal ban an entire generation of inter intermediate nuclear force weapons. And if you won't do that, don't leave your allies in Europe in a monopoly position, the Soviets with 1,200 of these things and the alliance with none. We didn't think that's the way you deter aggression and keep the peace. The president went, the first thing he did when he came into office was make a proposal on the most destabilizing weapons of all, start, and when the, so the strategic weapons. And when the Soviets said, well, we don't like that proposal, we said, all right, we'll be more flexible. I, at the urging of the president, went to, Ge went to Geneva and laid on the table a treaty to ban all chemical weapons. We don't want them to have a monopoly. But we said, look, let's come together. You come over here and see what we're doing. We'll go over there and see what you're doing. But let's save the kids of this world from chemical weapons. A brilliant proposal to get rid of all of them. And the Soviets, yet, yet, yet in the mutual balance force reduction. 
to reduce conventional forces. They're not even willing to tell us the base. Mrs. Ferraro knows that of how many, how many troops they have. There's four sessions. We have had an agreement with them on the hotline, but the Carter Mondale made an agreement, the SALT II agreement, but the Democratic Senate, they were a Democratic administration. The Democratic Senate wouldn't even ratify that agreement. It was flawed, it was unverifiable, and it was not good. Our president wants to reduce not just to stop, he wants to reduce dramatically nuclear weapons. And when the Soviets know they're going to have this strong president to deal with, and when this new administration, Mr. Chernyenko's, given more than a few months in office, can solidify its position, then they'll talk. But if they think the opposition, before they sit down, are going to give up the MX, give up the B-1, go for a freeze that locks in inferiority in Europe, all of these things unilaterally, before they're willing to talk, they may just sweat it out for four more weeks. Who knows? You were once quoted as saying that a nuclear war is winnable. Is that still your belief? And if not, under what circumstances would you use nuclear weapons if you were president? No, I don't think it's winnable. I was quoted wrong, obviously, because I never thought that. The Soviet planning, I did learn that when I was director of central intelligence, and I don't, um, I don't think there'd be any disagreement is based on that ugly concept. But I agree with the president. Should never be fought. Nuclear weapons should never be fought with. And that's, that's, uh, that's our approach. So therefore, let's encourage the Soviets to come to the table as we did at the Gromyko meeting. I wish everybody could have seen that one. The president, given the facts to Gromyko and all of these nuclear, nuclear meetings, excellent. Right on top of that subject matter. And I'll bet you that Gromyko went back to the Soviet Union saying, hey, listen, this president is calling the shots. We better move. But you know why I think we'll get an agreement? because I think it is in the interest of the Soviet Union to make it, just as it is in the interest of the United States. They're not deterred by rhetoric. I listened to their rhetoric for two years at the United Nations. I've lived in a communist country. It's not rhetoric that decides agreements. It's self-interest of, the, of the, those countries. Congresswoman Ferraro, you and Mr. Mondale are for a verifiable nuclear freeze. Some Democrats had said that verification may not be possible. How would you verify such an agreement and make sure that the Soviets are not cheating. Let me say, first of all, that I don't think that there is any issue that is more important in this campaign and in this election than the issue of war and peace. And since today is Eleanor Roosevelt's 100th birthday, let me quote her. She said, it is not enough to want peace. You must believe in it. It is not enough to believe in it. You must work for it. This administration's policies have indicated quite the opposite. The last time I heard Vice President Bush blame the fact that they didn't meet with a Soviet leader, and this is the first president in 40 years not to meet with a Soviet counterpart, he said the reason was because there were three Soviet leaders in the past three and a half years. I went and got a computer printout. It's five pages of the leaders, world leaders that the Soviet leaders have met with. And they're not little people. They're people like Mitterrand of France and Kroll of Germany and President Kiprianu of Cyprus, and you go down the line, five pages of people that the Soviet leaders have managed to meet with, and somehow they couldn't meet with the President of the United States. In addition to not meeting with his Soviet counterpart, this is the first President, and you're right, since the start of uh, negotiating arms control agreements, who has not ne uh, uh, negotiated an arms control agreement, but not only has he not negotiated one, he's been opposed to every single one that every other President has negotiated including Eisenhower, including Ford, and including Nixon. Now, let me just say that with reference to the uh, Vice President's comments about the intent and the desire of the United States in this administration, the Soviet Union did walk out of the talks. Uh, I agree. Uh, but it seems to me that in 1982, when the administration presented its start proposal, that it wasn't a realistic proposal, and that is the comment that was made by Secretary Haig after he left office because what it dealt with was it dealt just with land-based nuclear missiles, which is where the Soviets had the bulk of their missiles. But that aside, in 1982, I believe it was, their own negotiator, Nitsi, came out with a proposal called the Walk in the Woods proposal, which would have limited uh, the number of nuclear arms in Europe. That proposal was turned down by the administration, a proposal presented by its own administrator. Now, I'm delighted that they met with Mr. Gromyko, but they could have had that opportunity to meet with him in 1981 when he came to the new UN, uh, which he had done with every other president before, and in 1982 uh, as well. 
Uh, I guess my Congresswoman, biggest problem is... Congresswoman, I'm sorry. Uh, Speaking of limits, I have to impose a limit on okay. you. Vice President Bush. Well, I think there's quite a difference between Mr. Kump Kiprianu in Cyprus and the leader of the free world, Ronald Reagan, in terms of meeting. And the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union will meet with a lot of different people. We've been very close touch with Mr. Mitterrand, Mr. Cole, and, and others that have met with the leaders of the Soviet Union. But that's quite different than meeting with the President of the United States. The Soviets say, we'll have a meeting when we think there can be progress, and yet they left those talks. Uh, I'd like to correct my opponent on the walk in the woods. It was the Soviet Union that was unwilling to discuss the walk in the woods. They were the ones that gunned it down first, and the record is very, very uh, clear on that. Ms. Ferraro mentioned the inflexibility of our position on strategic arms. Yes, we offered first to get rid of all those, you try to re reduce the SS-18s and those weapons, but then we said if that's not good enough, there is flexibility. Let's talk about the bombers in the planes. So that's a very important point in terms of negotiation. Congresswoman, he that taketh away has to give back. I robbed you of your rebuttal. Therefore, you will have two minutes to rebut. Forgive me. I, you robbed me of my follow-up. That's yes. what you robbed me. So why don't I let her give me the follow-up? All right, and then you do your rebuttal. Minutes, okay. Congresswoman Ferrara, most polls show that the American, Americans feel that the Republicans, more than the Democrats, are better able to keep the U.S. out of war. We've had four years of relative peace under President Reagan. How can you convince the American public that the world would be a safer place under Carter Mondale? I think, first of all, um, you have to take a look at the current situation. We now have 50,000 nuclear warheads. Uh, we, have, we are building at the rate of five or six a day between us, and we have been doing that since this administration came into office. Uh, I think what you can do is look at what they've done and recognize that they're not going to do very much in the future. Uh, and so since they've done nothing, do we continue to build? Because an arms race doesn't lead to anything. It leads to another arms race, and that's it. Uh, Vice President Mondale has indicated that uh, what he would do, first of all, as soon as he gets into office, is contact his Soviet counterpart and set up uh, an annual summit meeting. Uh, that's number one. I don't think you can start negotiating until you start talking. Uh, secondly, he would issue a challenge, and the challenge would be in the nature of temporary, mutual, verifiable moratoria to halt um, uh, testing. Uh, in, uh, in the air, in the atmosphere, that would um, um, respond with a challenge from the Soviet Union, uh, we hope, to sit down and negotiate a treaty. Uh, that was done in 1960. I don't know what your lights are doing, Sam. You have another minute. Okay, I'm watching them blanking, so I have another minute. Um, what that would do is it would give us uh, the opportunity to sit down and negotiate a treaty. That was done in 1960. Uh, by President Kennedy in 1963. What he did was he issued a challenge to the Soviet Union. He said, we will not test in space, uh, in, in the atmosphere. If you will not, they did not. In two months, they sat down and they negotiated a treaty. Uh, we do not now have to worry about, uh, about that type of testing. It can be done, it will be done, if only you have the will to do it. Again, remember, it is mutual, it is verifiable, and is a challenge that once that challenge is not met, if testing were to resume, then we would continue to, uh, testing as well. Our last series of questions on foreign affairs from Mr. Boyd. <clears throat> Congresswoman Ferraro, you have had little or no experience in military matters, and yet you might someday find yourself commander in chief of the armed forces. How can you convince the American people and a potential enemy that you would know what to do to protect this nation's security and do you think in any way that the Soviets might be tempted to try to take advantage of you simply because you are a woman? Are you saying that I would have to have fought in a war in order to love peace? I'm not saying that. I'm asking you. You know what I asked. All right. The, I think what happens is when you, you try to equate whether or not I've had military experience, that's the natural conclusion. It's about as valid as saying that you would have to be black in order to despise racism, that you'd have to be female in order to be terribly offended by sexism. That's just not so. I think um, if you take a look at, at uh, where I've been, both in the Congress and where I intend to go, the type of person I am, I think that the, um, 
the people of this country can rely upon the fact that I will be a leader. I don't think the Soviet Union, for one minute, can sit down and make a determination on what I will do if I'm ever in a position to have to do something with reference to the Soviet Union. Quite frankly, I'm prepared to do whatever is necessary in order to uh, secure this country and make sure that, that security is maintained. Secondly, if the Soviet Union were to ever believe that they could challenge the United States with any sort of nuclear uh, forces or otherwise, if I were in a position of leadership in this country, they would be assured that they would be met with swift, concise, and certain retaliation. For Let me just say one other thing now. The most important thing, though, I think, is as a leader, that what one has to do is get to the point where you're not put into that position. And the way you get to that position of moving away from having to make a decision on force or anything else is by moving toward arms control. And that's not what's been done over the past four years. I think that if you were to take a look at the failures of this administration, that would have to be number one. I will not put myself in that position as a leader in this country. I will move immediately toward arms control negotiations. For my follow, I'm going to borrow a leaf from the Sunday night debate between your principals and ask you what is the single question you would most like to ask your opponent here on foreign policy? Oh, I don't, uh, I don't have a single most question. I guess the concern that I have is, is a concern not only as a vice presidential candidate, but as a, a citizen in this country. Um, my concern is that we are not doing anything to stop the arms race. And it seems to me that if we keep talking about um, military inferiority, which we do not have, we are at, this, we are at a comparable level with the Soviet Union. Um, our Joint Chiefs of Staff have said they'd never s exchange our military power for theirs. Uh, I guess the thing that I'd want is a commitment that you know, pretty soon they're going to do something about making this a safer world you know, for all of us. Vice President Bush, four years ago, President Reagan insisted that a military buildup would bring the Soviets to negotiate seriously. Since then, we have spent almost a trillion dollars on defense, but the Soviets are still building their military forces as rapidly as we are, and there are no negotiations. Was the President's original premise, his whole strategy, wrong? No. I think his strategy not only was correct, but is correct. You got to go back where we were. Clearly, when we came into office, the American people recognized that we had slipped into positions of inferiority on various things. Some of our planes, as the President points out, were older than the, older than the pilots, uh, ships that couldn't, couldn't go out to sea. And you had, a, you had a major problem with the military. Actually, the morale wasn't very good either. So we have had to strengthen the military, and we're well on the way to getting that job done. America is back in terms of military strength, in terms of our ability to deter aggression and keep the peace. All at the same time, however, we have made proposals and proposals and proposals, sound proposals, on reducing nuclear weapons. The strategic arms reduction talks were good proposals, and it's the Soviets that left the table. The intermediate nuclear force talks were sound talks, and I wish the Soviet Union had continued them the chemical weapon treaty to ban all chemical weapons. It was our initiative, not the Soviets. And we wish they would think anew and move forward to verification so that everybody would know whether the other side was keeping its word. But much more important, you'd reduce the level of terror. Similarly, we're reducing, trying to talk to them and are talking to them in Vienna about conventional force reductions. We've talked to them about human rights. I've met with Mr. Andropov and Mr. Chernyenko, and we mention and we try to do something about the human rights question. This oppression of Soviet Jews is absolutely intolerable, and so we have to keep pushing forward on the, on the moral grounds as well as on the arms reduction grounds. But it is my view that because this president has been strong, and because we've redressed the imbalances, and I think we're very close to having, getting that job done, the Soviets are more likely to make a deal. The Soviets made an ABM treaty when they thought we were going to deploy an ABM system. So I am optimistic for the future. Once they realize that they will have this strong, principled president to negotiate with, strong leadership, 
and yet with demonstrable flexibility on arms control. And now I'll give you a chance, Mr. Vice President, to ask the question you'd most like to ask of your opponent. I have, I have none I'd like to ask ever, but I'd sure like to use the time. Talk about the World Series or something of that nature. Let me, uh, let me put it this way. I, I don't have any questions about it. We, have, we are so different from the, the, the Reagan-Bush administration, is so different uh, from the Carter-Mondale administration that the American people are going to have the clearest choice. It's a question of going back to the failed ideas of the past, where we came in, 21.5% on those interest rates, inflation, despair, malaise, no leadership, blaming the American people for failed leadership. Or another option, keep this recovery going till it benefits absolutely everybody. Peace at home, peace abroad, prosperity, opportunity. I'd like to hear her talk on those things, but I think the yellow light is flashing, and so we'll leave it there. Nothing on the World Series? Well, Congresswoman Ferraro. I'll go. I think the uh, Vice President's comment about the Carter-Mondale administration is an indication of just, it's, it really typifies this administration. It's an administration that looks backwards, not forwards, and into the future. I must say that I'm also tickled by their comments on human rights. Uh, the Soviet Union in 1979 allowed 51,000 people to emigrate because in the large measure of this administration's policies over the past four years, 1,313 people got out of the Soviet Union in 1983 or 1984. Uh, that's not a great record on human rights and certainly not a record on human rights achievements. This administration has spent a trillion dollars on defense, but it hasn't gotten a trillion dollars of national security. Vice President Bush, your rebuttal? No rebuttal. Well, we then can go to the closing statements. Uh, each statement will be four minutes in length, and we'll begin with the Vice President. Well, in a couple of weeks, you, the American people, will be faced, three weeks, with a choice. It's the clearest choice in some 50 years. And the choice is, do we move forward with strength and with prosperity, or do we go back to weakness, despair, disrespect. Ronald Reagan and I have put our trust in the American people. We've moved some of the power away from Washington, D.C. and put it back with the people. We're pulling together. The neighborhoods are safer because crime is going down. Your sons and daughters are doing better in school. Test scores are going up. There's a new opportunity lying out there in the future. Science, technology, and space offering opportunity to to everybody, all the young ones coming up. And abroad, there's new leadership and, and respect. And Ronald Reagan is clearly the strong leader of the free world. And I'll be honest with you, it's a joy to serve with a president who does not apologize for the United States of America. Mr. Mondale, on the other hand, has one idea, go out and tax the American people. And then he wants to repeal indexing to wipe out the one protection that those at the lowest end of the economic scale have, protecting them against being rammed into higher and higher tax brackets. We just owe our country too much to go back to that kind of an approach. I'd like to say something to the young people. I, I started a business. I know what it is to have a dream and have a job and work hard to employ others and really to participate in the American dream. And some of you out there are finishing high school or college, and some of you are starting out in the working place. And we want for you America's greatest gift, and that is opportunity. And then on peace, yes, I, I did serve in combat. I was shot down when I was a young kid, scared to death. And all that did, saw friends die. But that heightened my convictions about peace. It is absolutely essential that we guarantee the young people that they will not know the agony of war. America's gift, opportunity, and peace. Now we do have some unfinished business. We must continue to go ahead. The world is too complex to go back to vacillation and weakness. We have too much going on to go back to the failed policies of the past. The future is too bright not to give it our best shot. Together we can go forward and lift America up to meet her greatest dreams. Thank you very much.
<laughs> Thank you very much. I must say now, in matters of equity, you will be allowed applause at the end of your closing statement, so if you begin it now, please. Yeah, I hope somebody wants to applaud. Being the candidate for vice president of my party is the greatest honor I have ever had. But it's not only a personal achievement for Geraldine Ferraro and certainly not only the bond that I feel as I go across this country with women throughout the country. I wouldn't be standing here if Fritz Mondale didn't have the courage and my party didn't stand for the values that it does, the values of fairness and equal opportunity. Those values make our country strong. And the future of this country and how strong it will be is what this election is all about. Over the last two months, I've been traveling all over the country talking to the people about the future. I was in Kentucky and I spoke to the Dye House family. He works as a, for a car dealer. And he's worried about the deficits and how high interest rates are going to affect his job. Every place I go, I see young parents, their children, they say to me, what are we going to do to stop this nuclear arms race? I was in Dayton, Ohio a week and a half ago and I sat with the Allen family who live next door to a toxic dump and they are very, very concerned about the fact that those toxics are seeping into the water that they and their neighbors drink. And those people love this country and they're patriotic. But it's not the patriotism that you're seeing in the commercials as you watch television these days. Their patriotism is not only a pride in the country as it is but a pride in this country that is strong enough to meet the challenges of the future. Do you know when we find jobs for the eight and a half million people who are unemployed in this country, you know, we'll make our economy stronger and that will be a patriotic act. When we reduce the deficits, we cut interest rates and I know the president doesn't believe that, but it's so. We cut those interest rates, young people can buy houses, that's pro-family and that will be a patriotic act. When we educate our children, oh, good Lord, they're going to be able to compete in a world economy, and that makes us stronger, and that's a patriotic act. When we stop the arms race, we make this a safer, saner world, and that's a patriotic act. And when we keep the peace, young men don't die, and that's a patriotic act. Those are the key to the future, and who can be the leader for the future? When Walter Mondale was Attorney General of Minnesota, he led the fight for a man who could not afford to get justice because he couldn't afford a lawyer. When he was in the Senate, he fought for child nutrition programs. He wrote the House, Fair Housing Act. He even, he even investigated the concerns and the abuses of migrant workers. And why did he do that? Those weren't popular causes. You know, no one had ever heard of Gla Clarence Gideon, the man without a lawyer. Children don't vote, and migrant workers aren't exactly a powerful lobby in this country, but he did it because it was right. Fritz Mondale has said that he'd rather lose a battle over decency than win one over self-interest, and I agree with him. Now, this campaign is not over. For our country, for our future, for the principles we believe in, Walter Mondale and I have just begun to fight. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Vice President Bush, Congresswoman Ferraro, the members of our panel for joining us in this League of Women Voters debate. I'd like to join you in thanking them, the city of Philadelphia, and the League of Women Voters.